and it's day one and you walking in there on the first day, man, you in there, man, but you feel something. It's right in here, man, and it's screaming, and it's yelling, and it's saying, release me, and it's saying, I am the number one determinant of the success or failure of my students. Hey, y'all, when you get back, kick some butt, and I'll see you in the winner's circle celebrating your victory. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You got this. You got this. You got this. Thank you, everybody. And we are live. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to week 201. Man, that sounds that sound different, dog, y'all, don't it? That sounds a little different. 201 of the AP and New Principles Academy. Let me see who we got in the building this morning. We got always first, man. We got Mona Omomolak is in the building down in Orlando. We got my man Ricardo Giannis down in Texas. We got AP Patrick Lawrence in the building, Bloomfield, Connecticut, Sharon Wright. Uh, is in the building. She said hello to myself and the queen, my wife. We got we got Akimo Dawson in El Paso, man. I was just in El Paso. Were you in that audience, El Kimo? I, I mean, I, I, I Kimo. Uh, I had a good time in El Paso, man. That was good stuff. Rodney Richardson down in Hampton, Takesha High, Virginia, Grace Castaneda, Kyle, Texas, Marsha Poe, San Diego. Hey, Marsha, you know I was having a good time, man. They got that little slight morning chill in san diego but 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 that was okay because it wasn't jersey and i was out there in my shorts and my t-shirt man i did three miles worked up a sweat then that sun came i was like man i don't want to leave san diego that was on uh wednesday but i'm back here man outside right now it's looking ugly man it's looking ugly <laughs> constant Sherrod down there in mississippi uh john Polignano, I probably messed that up, man. Tennessee, he said, he said, you love that I'm on fire. You know I'm getting ready to deliver that in a minute because I couldn't do that last week in Ohio. They would have called the fire department on me. Dr. Charles Williams, Vancouver, Washington. Kim Kim Souza, Hawaii. Aloha out there in Hawaii. Let's do it right. There you go. There you go. Right. So um, Marie back. Uh, Batiste Rock, Essex County, New Jersey is in the building. Dr. Rachel Edo, Edo Eckett is in the building. Marilyn, y'all make sure you check her out on all social media platforms, including her book. I think it's The Principal's Journey. That's Dr. Rachel Edo Eckett. She's been on. She'll be back in the summertime. We got Tash uh, Tashika Truesdale in the building, Atlanta. Demetrius Scott, my brother, Dr. Demetrius Scott. Y Yolanda McKinney, she's going to be on here soon, too. We got Rashad Davis out in the 702 Vegas. Michael Benton, keep on doing what you're doing. Cincinnati, Ohio, Dr. Rella Hicks is in the building. Hit that share button, hit that retweet button. Let them know we here, we here. We got East Stars, New Jersey in the building today. We got Scott Wiley, uh, Chester, uh, West Virginia, Donna Medina Sherrigan's in the building down there in Georgia. Uh, where we at, where we at? We got, I can't make this out, man. Curry Kim. I think it says supporting East Orange colleagues. I hear that. Arcella Austria in the building. Angelise Taranjo Rosales is here. Cami Berry, I'm getting ready to wrap it up, y'all. Bev Hill, Melissa Jones, Chunu. Keep her in your prayers. That's one of the fam. We got the queen. I see you up there. The queen of the castle is in the building. Kimberly Broughton, Cafele. We got Nolene Martin. September, Devon, Vance, Daniels. I'm getting ready to wrap it up, man. Let me see if I got any of uh, my local homies in the building. I see Edwin Garcia um, in Passaic. That's one of my locals. Been right after. I see I'm going to wrap it up right here with Michael Moore. 
the grandson of the great Katherine Johnson. She's he is right here in the building, East Orange in the building. I see you, Mike. One day we got to get together, man. I know I say that every time I see your name, but one day we got to get together. Every time I'm in these states, man, including yours in North Carolina, I'm in and out, you know, so we got to try to figure it out. I got to just shout out. This is not one, not one of the local homies, but I got to shout this person out that I'm ready to go. The boss educator, Dr. LaQuanta Nelson is in the building. We were in New York yesterday at the Innovative School Summit, and she was the closing keynote. Man, she rocked place man she brought that mississippi uh power up here and just rocked the house man so let me let me close with her and let's 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 get to it y'all let me adjust this camera a little bit there we go let's let's get to it let me say to everybody formally before i say formally hit the share button hit the retweet button hit the 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 the, the repost button whatever these names are Tag them Facebook groups, tag your homie, let somebody know. Maybe you got to text them, maybe you got to call them, but let them know we here. We starting Women's History Month with these three phenomenal women from Jersey. But I got to say to you formally now, good morning. Greetings. Welcome to week 201 of the AP and New Principles Academy. Man. Hey, y'all, you know what's coming, man. You know what's coming. I was in Lima, Ohio last um, last Saturday. Man, powerful conference, man, put on by my man, Emmanuel Curtis, right? But I was in a room within the convention center and the hotel, like right in the middle. So I knew if I screamed in there, you know, fire. You know, they'd be, they be shutting me down, man. So I had to repress, I had to suppress that for now two weeks, right? But I'll look where I'm at right now, baby. I'm home. So I just want to let you know how I feel, right? Because I because I want how I feel to rub off on how you feel, despite whatever the challenges, the obstacles, the pressures, and demands were from last week. You still got to maintain that flame. So I'm going to let you know where I'm at. I'm on fire. Ah! <laughs> I gotta let that out, man. Oh yeah, I feel good now. <laughs> I looked at my son. He like, yo, man, you be bugging, right? <laughs> but you know, I y'all don't understand, man. I know I don't do what you do. You 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 in them schools, man. That that's not easy work. It's it's fun work, but it's not easy work. But see, like what I do. Man, in and out of these airports, these planes, sitting next to these people and it's cramped up in them seats, man. And sometimes they coughing, man. Flight attendant, rude. Gate agent, rude. TSA officer, rude. You know, then driving all the miles to the hotel, then sleeping in that bed. That's like, like, like it dips in one place where everybody's sleeping. So you now you can't be comfortable, right? Or oh, all this stuff, the food nasty in the hotel, man. And then you got the audience. And sometimes you walk in the space, that audience hostile, man. <laughs> Everybody ain't asking for the Kefele autograph. Everybody ain't asking for the selfie with Kefele. Some of the people look at me like, yo, say what you got to say and get the heck up on out here, out of here. So, you know, when I get here on Saturday, man, I'm with the fam, man. I let you know that I'm on fire. Let's go. Listen, man, let me let me go through these announcements real quick. Shout out to the leader in me, leader in me under uh, under under the Kobe Stephen Kobe Symposium in San Diego, man. They 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 let me keynote that man. They blessed me, man. I keynoted that. We had a good time. Shout out to I'm in a documentary for those of you that don't know called Preschool to Prison, and. It, it, they take it to different film, to different 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 locations to to um to view by different audiences at different film festivals, that type of thing, under the leadership of Dr. Karen Baptiste. So shout out to them. We um we were at Lehman College in the Bronx, and man, it was a packed house, standing room only, man. So we showed a we showed a film, Preschool to Prison, and then those of us in the cast who can who can be there, and I'm typically there, then we we speak on a panel, man. So shout out if anybody from out there is from Leader and Me or anybody out there from preschool to pipe prison in, in the Bronx last week at Lehman, shout out to you. Glad to see you. And then yesterday, Innovative School Summit in New York City, 
Marriott Marquis, man. I was the keynote yesterday, the, um, the opening keynote yesterday. And, man, we had a good time. You know I brought my, my dancing shoes for a little Frankie Beverly. We all won. You know, when I got them big audiences like that, we got we to gotta dance off that stress, man. And then we get to the, to the actual um, uh, keynote address. So shout out to uh, Innovative School Summit under Phil phil uh phil price and um and kevin stewart man we had a great day uh welcome to the first timers if this is in fact your first time what that means is that you have missed 200 weeks so you can go to the um to the youtube channel ap and new principles academy hit that subscribe button hit that subscribe button hit that subscribe button we got twenty thousand three hundred subscribers right now but i want more i want twenty five thousand, right so make sure you hit the subscribe button and um and 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 then binge watch. So you know them shows y'all be binge watching. Turn that stuff off and binge watch this academy. Watch all two hundred one sessions, right? Um and and while you're on the channel, make sure you check out that midweek fire, man. Them shorts I do every Wednesday. It's some I don't know what time Wednesday whenever it's whenever it's convenient, but I do the midweek uh, fire. Those are 60 second shorts I do every Wednesday. And then make sure those of you that aspire to become a, 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 a speaker. When I was in San Diego, here come pe people walking up on me. I want to be a speaker like you. Kefele, can you give me some pointers? Then it, 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 uh, Lehman Kyle's the other day. I want to be a speaker like you. Can you give me some pointers? Then yesterday, Innovative Summit. I want to be a speaker. Can you give me some pointers? I said, here, let me, let me take out your phone. Go to AP and New Principles Academy. I got five videos, nine hours to show you how to become a speaker like, like me, right? So you got you to gotta watch the videos. So one lady said, yeah, yeah, I, okay, I'll watch the videos. But can you tell me something like right now? I said, no. No, that's why I made the videos. What I'm going to tell you something now for this going to be in the video. Just watch the video, <laughs> the videos, nine hours. If you could watch your little, your little show you watch for nine hours, you could watch the videos on how to become a professional speaker for nine hours. Right. Let's go. Um, School Leadership Institute with Principal Kefele, July 9 and 10 in Houston. If you haven't registered yet, what are you waiting for? We're going to be in person, live. This is the seventh annual. So go to principalcafele.com, scroll down to my announcements, and then click the, the link, and then go on to the page, and you will see all the information you need. My topic, what is my value to the teachers that I supervise instructionally? That's the topic. Two days. So we're talking, um, we're talking about 16 hours, something like that, 14, 16 hours, whatever it is, in person, in Houston. I want to see you in the building. Hit the share button, hit the retweet button, let them know, let them know. Let me do my monologue real quick and then I'm bringing up my guests. My monologue, I'll keep it simple, I'll keep it short because we got a lot to talk about. My monologue is where do you spend the bulk of your time during the school day? Hey, principal out there. Hey, assistant principal out there. Where do you spend the bulk of your time? throughout the course of the day. I'm trying to get myself centered in this camera. There we go, that's a little better. Get yourself a log, right? Hear me somebody, hear me. Get yourself a log and write down, put, put the times in there, like put every half hour, every, every 15 minutes, whatever the intervals that, that would work best for you and jot down where you are, right? So every, so every 15 minutes, where are you? Every 15 minutes, where are you? Every 15 minutes, where are you? And then notice where you're spending the bulk of your time. And if it turns out that you that, that your log, because your log is serving as your mirror, right? So if your log is indicating that you are spending the bulk of your time in your office or the bulk of your time in the main office, then now you see it because see you may not have been, been able to see it before you logged it before you wrote it so now you're seeing and it's like oh my god wait a minute i'm spending six hours of my day in my office so at what point am i leading the school at what point am i coaching the staff at what point am i in classrooms when my log ain't lying my log is indicating that I'm spending whole days, full days in my office, and then I'm scratching my head wondering why the school is not moving the way I want it to move. Well, because your school's not being led. But sometimes we need, led by you anyway, might be being led by them young people, 
but it ain't being led by you. So you might want to have yourself this log. You could, you know, write in your phone, your tablet, your whatever you use. Some of y'all might be old school like me, and you you might use something like like this, right? So whatever it is, log where you are in 15 minute intervals, 30 minute intervals, whatever. And and and, and then you get a better picture of where you are spending the bulk of your day that matters enough said i got guests today man let me bring them on up here man i got all this i gotta change that background too so i, I messed that up every week but that, it looks it looks it, it looks decent but it's gonna look real good in a second good morning folks good morning man i'm glad y'all are here there we go now we good i'm glad you're here we got east orange in the building uh, one way or the other. I'm born there, I work there, right? But East Orange is in the building, 3.9 square mile city in New Jersey. For those of you that don't know it, it produces superstars. You know, you hear about the famous people, you know, the recording artists and the athletes, but that ain't all that East Orange produces, y'all. East Orange produces some of the best educators on the planet. It's a, it's a little small town. And there's a lot of folks in East Orange, folks, hear me real well. It's a lot of folks in East Orange that don't work in East Orange anymore, but their roots are in East Orange, right? They, you, you know, they, they, they learn their foundation is in East Orange. So, so East Orange, if you don't know East Orange, like, like I'm looking at my man here, this is my brother here, Dr. Vincent Stallings is on here. He, he's not from East Orange, but he's been in East Orange for about 25 years. So he is East Orange as well, right? So so whatever it is, East Orange be producing some folks, man. So if you don't know East Orange, you better ask somebody. So I got um I got I got three principles here. First one I'm gonna read her bio is from East Orange. And man, I, I, I had to pray over if I was gonna read this first paragraph, man, because she has something in there. I was like, ah oh, man, what, what what the people how they gonna perceive me on this? So but I said, I I said I'm gonna read. Here we go. Here we go. Watch this, y'all. This Crystal, Dr. Crystal Davis began her teaching career. I'm going to read fast, y'all, because I got to read three today, right? Um, began her teaching career as a first grade teacher in East Orange at Loverture Elementary School in 2000. Now, here go the part, right? Here go the part, y'all. She was selected by famed educator. Oh, man. I ain't never heard that one before. Famed educator, author, and motivational speaker, Principal Baruti Kafele. Woo! <laughs> to serve on his leadership team at Patrick, he Patrick Healy Middle School, where she was appointed to the position of teacher on special assignment. It's like when I read that, I shouldn't even be saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. When I read that, it's like uh, she said, fame, educator, author. So that, that, that elevate me. Then she said, Patrick Healy. That brought me way down. <laughs> <laughs> not because of the current healy now i don't want to get anybody wrong i don't want anybody i don't want anybody to misunderstand that that's 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 my world right so we're talking about my world in 2020 uh, 2002 right that brought me down i'm back i'm back to where i need to be now right so matter of fact, i need to elevate right so where she, <laughs> let me stop let me stop so Dr. where she was appointed to the position of teacher on special assignment dr davis worked with principal failure to address discipline challenges in the school Dr. Davis was appointed as assistant principal in the Hillside Public Schools, where she served in the capacity of five, for five years. Dr. Davis had the privilege and honor of returning to the East Orange School District, where she was appointed principal of Althea Gibson Academy from 2010 to 2020. Hit that share button, hit that retweet, folks. Tag somebody. Dr. Davis earned a Bachelor of Science in Education, Elementary Education, Master of Arts in Urban Education, Administration and Supervision, and Doctorate Degree in Organizational Leadership. Dr. Davis is a longtime learner that's been active in personal and professional leadership development programs, notably the prestigious Scott Hawkins Leadership Institute and the Howard University Urban Superintendents Program. Dr. Davis is, an, is active in her community through affiliation in various organizations. She's a member of the New Jersey Principals and Supervisors Association and New Jersey School Boards Association. Additionally, she's a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Jack and Jill of America Incorporated and the Lynx Incorporated, where she serves as president of the Morris County chapter. Dr. Davis is an active member of the Clinton Memorial AM, AME Zion Church, where she chairs the scholarship committee. 
Most recently, Dr. Davis was on the Boonton School Board, where she chaired the Administration Labor Relations Committee and served on the Finance Curriculum and Policy Committee. Dr. Davis is the recipient of several awards and special recognition. She is a member of the Kappa Delta Pi Honor Society and Alpha Delta Kappa International Honor, or Honor Honorary Organization for Women Educators. She was the recipient of the 2013 Shirley Chisholm Award in Early Childhood Education presented by then Speaker of the New Jersey Assembly and former Lieutenant Governor, the late Sheila Y. Oliver. She was uh, appointed to serve on the transition team education committee for former East Orange Mayor Lester E. Taylor. In 2022, she was recognized by the East Orange School District for demonstrating uh, thorough leadership that recovery from learning loss is possible, for demonstrating high assessment gains across all grade levels. And in 2022, Dr. Um, Davis was honored by the North Public, Public Schools during the Women's History Month celebration, Powerful Women in Politics. Received recognition from the spring 2003 NJSLA results that indicate that Dr. Davis third and fourth graders matched and or exceeded the state average for ELA and exceeded the state average for grade three math. Davis is the mother of two children, Brandon, age 18, Jenna, age 16. Dr. Davis is engaged to Dr. Michael Taylor. A lot there, y'all. Well, we're going to unpack it when we get into this conversation. Next, we got Dr. Evie Joseph, born and raised in lower middle class in a lower middle class neighborhood in Newark, New Jersey, mm -hmm. in hard working Haitian two hard working Haitian immigrant parents. Her educational achievements include a Bachelor of Arts in English with a specialization in Eng uh, education from Rutgers the State University. She also earned her master's in administration and supervision from Kane University just last month. Hey, do me for so one of y'all mute for me because it's been a lot of background. Um, just there you go. Just last month, she successfully defended her dissertation titled "Impact of Pan the Impact of the Pandemic on the Social Emotional Health of School Principals," and has now attained a doctorate of education from Saint Peter's University. I want to read that dissertation title to you again because it's relevant. Um, the impact of the pandemic on the social emotional health of school principals. We're going to unpack that later. In 1996, Dr. Joseph began her career as a teacher for the Sylvan Learning Center in Newark, New Jersey. She was eventually promoted to lead teacher and then director of the center in charge of operations and management of teachers. Following her dream of having her own classroom, Dr. Joseph began her career with East Orange, the East Orange School District as an eighth grade language arts teacher in 1998. Five years later, she was assigned as the academic coach where she worked with her colleagues to increase the academic achievement. She was promoted to assistant principal at that same middle school in 2005 and five years later became principal of an elementary school in the same district. In 2020, Dr. Joseph was transferred to her current location as principal of the brand of a brand new pre-kindergarten to uh, grade five and now grade eight building named after the late Lieutenant Governor Sheila Y. Oliver amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout her nearly 30 year career, Dr. Joseph has earned the following awards and recognitions. Sylvan Learning Center Educator of the Year, John L. Costley Middle School Teacher of the Year, Governor's Teacher Recognition Recipient, uh, John L. Costley Middle School Award of Appreciation. 2017-18, the district recognized her school for her students' academic achievement on state tests. Her school was also identified as a future ready school in 2018. She's a member of the Association of Supervision Curriculum Development, ASCD, and the New Jersey Principals and Supervisors Association. Lastly, she considers herself to be a humanistic leader with adept technologi technology skills. Her ed educational journey and decision to work in the urban environment give her a unique perspective on education. She's highly organized and believes in growth mindset. Outside of professional interests, she enjoys traveling, planning events, reading, and spending time with her fiance, young son, family, and friends one more y'all that's a lot of stuff there too man good stuff good stuff one more miss tomiko hunt has been an educator for 26 years she received her undergraduate degree from morgan state university in vocal music education her graduate degree in supervision and school leadership from kane university certification in middle school math from Montclair State University and her certificate in social emotional learning from Rutgers University. After college, uh, Principal Hunt returned to her hometown of East Orange, New Jersey to begin her teaching career as a middle school math teacher for East Orange Public Schools. During her time teaching middle school math, 
Ms. Hunt began to think outside the box with her teaching and decided to bring real world experiences into the classroom, which increased student scores, meeting the New Jersey Department of Education proficiency rate by 15 percent consecutively. Over her tenure as, teach as an educator, she has held positions such as math coach, supervisor of Title I, assistant principal and principal. Ms. Hunt has served as principal for Roselle Public Schools for six years and mentor for the New Jersey Principal Supervisor, Supervisor Association in New Jersey Excel for new school administrators. As a visionary educator, Principal Hunt is profoundly dedicated to providing all students with the foundation of content knowledge, social emotional learning, real world experiences that will support the whole child in their overall development to guide students in becoming lifelong learners who can meet the demands of college and careers and become productive citizens in the 21st century. Ms. Hunt has received various accolades for her work in education with her students and staff. She's a re recent recipient of the Curriculum Associates it's Inspires Awards 2024 and Extraordinary Educators, Veri uh, Verizon Innovative Learning School Leader and a member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. And finally, to be named the Inspire Award winner 2024 for Curriculum Associates is an honor to have the opportunity to work with many like-minded educators, educators and professionals, all with the same goal of student achievement is humbling. I've worked with Curriculum Associates for over 11 years and have used their educational materials to drive instruction and increase student achievement as a teacher and school leader. To be recognized for the work that I've done as a school principal makes me proud, especially since I could not have done this without the hard work and trust of my staff and students. I remember last year as the newly assigned principal of Leonard V. Moore Middle School asking my staff to take this leap of faith with me and do something you've never done before. And they did. It gave and it did and it gave and, and it now uh, I messed up before and they did it. And now here we are. To know that I have received this award for doing what I love gives me even more energy to continue to defy convention to advance student achievement. Woo! Oh, some powerful bios. Powerful bios. We ready, y'all. Hit that on, uh, hit that retweet, repost, share anything. Tag someone, tag them Facebook leadership groups. Let them know we're here. We're ready to rock. Uh, plan to spend some time with us this morning. Y'all, we got a lot to talk about. Let me get myself set up here. Here we go. Hey, Dr. Davis, let me let me start with you. Um, I've known you for over 20 years mm -hmm. and, and and i've only known you in a leadership capacity you so i've only known you as a leader you are a product of a leadership family mm -hmm. it's inclusive of your father serving as the chief of police in the city of east orange so leadership is in your blood so i want to ask you um why why leadership for you particularly principal leadership and let me add this to it and what is the why of your leadership so thank you principal Caffelli, for having me on your show it is an honor because i know you as a mentor first right uh, and as a friend and my east orange homeboy so for me i would say that leadership called me um along my journey whether it's professionally my civic journey and leadership in my community uh leadership called me as far as my why, when you think about principal leadership, so I'm a born educator. I went to school to teach. Like my major was elementary education. I knew that I wanted to pour into the lives of others, that I am a, I am a true champion for children. And I believe that you must be the change that you want to see. So, you know, you hear people sit around staff meetings and schools and districts and complain about what's not happening, what should happen. So that's not me. If I believe that something should change, then you know what? I'm going to be that change. I knew that I had a lot to offer on the macro level. While, yes, in the classroom, I'm teaching, I'm pouring into the lives of those 20 or 21 students. But if I led at a larger level, I have maximum impact, right? So that I can truly change generations, right? When you are leading a school, not only are you leading hundreds of students, you're changing their trajectory. You are truly changing the impact that they will have on their family and their communities and all that they can pour into the lives of others. So my why really centers around uh, my two children, right? So I want the best for all children that I want for my children. And that's what I tell people. I tell my staff, um, it's not about 
you just teaching these kids. These kids are going to grow up. They're going to live in the world with your children, with your grandchildren. So you should want their very best for them, right? Um, it's not just a cliche that children are our future because they really are. Uh, I think about some of the children that I taught during my first years of teaching, they're grown, right? Some of them are doing well. And it put a smile on my face to know that I actually had an impact on their life. So that's my why, truly leaving this world a better place and impacting the lives of hundreds of children, which will impact generations to come. I love it. I love it. You know, you're, you're, everything you said spills into this. I had, I had a part one and two for you. Everything you said spills into this part two. Uh, let me, let me, let me go back to me first. I, I wanted to teach in East Orange badly. And, and the reason is obvious because I'm, I'm a product of East Orange. I, I wear East Orange on, on both sleeves, right? I've been living in Jersey City for 35 years. And when people ask me, where are you from? I say East Orange, right? It's, you know, Jersey City is secondary. Mm -hmm. So so here's the thing. I wanted to teach in East Orange because I'm a product of East Orange. I wanted to lead in East Orange because I'm a product of, of East Orange. So, 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 so when I, when I listen to what you said, and I juxtapose that with something you have in your bio. When you when you you went to Hillside, but when you came back, you said, and I, I want I want to quote you here. You said it was a, a privilege and an honor to come back to East Orange, right? My my question to you: Talk to us, because there are people on the call, you know, just just out here in the world who are watching today that, that you and I don't know, but 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 they're they're out here. Talk to us about the pride an honor of being able to serve in a city that produced you what what is what does that feel like the feeling is unreal so yes i grew up in east orange i went through the public school system in east orange um henry hamilton was my first principal it was mine too by the way yes, laura tremens was my middle school principal at vld and irene's nichols was my high school principal at clifford j scott so i had other opportunities you know i was recruited washington dc philadelphia um prince george's county maryland new york city public schools i could have gone wherever but i made a decision to come back to east orange like all of my friends they moved to other states and i was the only one that made a decision to uh, go back home. So for me, it's, you know, I'm a servant leader. I truly believe that at my core, it's about serving others, right? So what do I have to really pour into East Orange? East Orange produces greatness. And along my journey, I would envision myself. I would envision like Brenda Veal, Irene Nichols, Gladys Calhoun, the greatness that they brought. These were some sharp women, you know, walking through the city, walking through hallways. And I will look at them and say, wow, I aspire to be like these women. Yeah. Um, I love East Orange. Not only did I grow up there and work there now, I continue to do a lot in East Orange. I visit church services, community forums. I shop in East Orange. I mean, that is my city. So there is a feeling that when I am there, it's a feeling like unlike any other. I cannot give to other places the way I give to East Orange. And I don't mean to say that. I know I have a lot to offer, but there's a different level of passion and love that I bring that I'll never give up. That I know each and every last one of those children at my school, those are my kids. I know all their names. I know their families. Um, I am invested in what I do. I want the best for this city. No place is perfect. Do we have challenges? Yes, every place has challenges. But we have to work together to help solve those challenges. And as far as I'm concerned, I am in it and I will be in it until the day that God calls me home. I, I love it. I love it. I love it. Dr. Joseph, um, you know, with, with, with social emotional learning, I think it's common that we typically apply that conversation to young people. Right. We, we talk about SEL in the schools. We know that there are certain states that don't want any parts of SEL in their schools. But we, we, we talk about that with young people. What what intrigued me in your bio was your dissertation topic, and which is why I repeated it. So now let's 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 go into it. Your dissertation topic, the impact of the pandemic on the social, emotional health of school principals. That's an important topic. And obviously you 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 knew that. And that's why you went on and did the research. So in a nutshell, what were your findings? 
I found that, uh, first of all, I'd like to also thank you for including me on this panel. Um, I really, truly appreciate it. I've always um, considered you a mentor from afar. We worked in the same complex at the same time, and I've always been uh, uh, very proud of your work. Um, so I thank you for including me with these phenomenal women. Yeah, I um, appreciate you. And now with my topic, I chose that topic because it was in the middle of the pandemic and there was always a lot of talk um, how principals, administrators needed to support our students, just as you said, um, so their social emotional health as we needed to. But then I began to think, well, who's pouring into us? You have to pour. So, so then I thought, okay, this is perfect research. I needed to talk to my colleagues who were going through the pandemic the same way, who suffered loss, who, but still we were had a responsibility to others. We had a responsibility to our staff. We had a responsibility to our students, yet we were being drained because no one was pouring into us. So that was what led me to that research. And I discovered that um, many of our, our colleagues forgot that they needed to pour into themselves and forgot that that is an important part of leadership that you need to take the time because you can't pour from an empty cup. You can't help others if your emotional bank isn't. Um, fulfilled so so let me let me ask you this um and I, and I and i hope i'm not going out of bounds on this what about you dr joseph during that time because see i you know it, it it was so interesting for me doc that when the pandemic hit i i had certain opinions about what a principal could do during that time i, I didn't know factually because none of us ever lived that but i had certain opinions certain thoughts and i and i, and I have a platform so i put them out there and next thing i know as hard as i work throughout the course of of of, of a year on, uh, during normal time i was working harder when we were doing it during the stay at home because i was doing about five presentations a day because of the time zones now i could hit all four in the u.s in the same day so i'm i'm i'm, I'm articulating things that just made sense to me but it wasn't rooted in anything because none of us had any research because we never experienced a, a pandemic. So I want to ask you on a personal level, and I might expand this to the other to the, to the other two of, uh, on the panel. What about your own emotional health during that time? And you can keep it on the professional side, right? Um, what were you going through? Because you yeah. were so used to being in the school. Right. And it's very hard to keep it on the professional side. And I think that's the point because you're home now and you're working from home, you're working partially from home and partially in the, in the um, office at the school, but you can't separate. There's no way to separate your home life and your professional life. And on top of it, you're worried about the health of your health and the health of, health of your family. And that's also extended to the East Orange community, the community at large. How do I keep everyone safe? How do I keep myself safe? How do I make sure I don't bring that home? So I think what happens, and to either point, you did work harder because you're home and there's no stop, there's no time. There's no, okay, it's four o'clock, I have to go pick up such and such. It's five o'clock, I need to go do this. You're home. So you're working from the moment you get up. You don't have to, you know, get professionally dressed. You just have to get at your on your computer and you're working and you're working all the way through. Um, so there was no stop and, and there was an unknown outside your doors. So I think so I found that we just all worked harder and we we felt that responsibility to take care of the students that, that we're charged with taking care of. And that also included staff members who saw you and they wanted to talk to you and tell you about their loss. They lost uncles, they lost aunts, they lost parents. How do you help that individual get in front of students and be able to pour into them? Yeah. So that responsibility just was a weighed, weighed heavily on the administrator in the building. Yeah, yeah, like, 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 like another EO homie said, a difficult balance. Judith Stoddard, who was on here a couple of weeks ago. You know, um, let me stay with you, Dr. Joseph. Um, back in 1996, Sheila Oliver, at the time board president, Sheila Oliver, handed me a plaque that read Teacher of the Year. That was big time, and it was big time coming from her. When I was appointed AP in East Orange, she was still the board president. When I was appointed principal, she was still the board president. She moved on 
And among the things she did, which would take us quite a while to list all of them, she became the first black woman speaker for the New Jersey Assembly, State Assembly. She became the Lieutenant Governor. She had an untimely transition recently as, as we all on this panel know. But here you are in a school, a brand new school, I might add, that is named after the late Lieutenant Governor Sheila Y. Oliver. My question to you, given all that she's accomplished, all she means to, new, to East Orange, and all she, she means and meant to the state of New Jersey, what is it like for you on a personal level, Dr. Evie Joseph, to, um, to, to, to be the, the inaugural principal of a school named after someone um, as phenomenal as Lieutenant Governor Oliver? It's the ultimate privilege because I know that she represented, she was a role model to women like me, women in leadership, women that, that know and understand that we need to put students first, put our community first. And that's what she showed in everything that she did, everything that she um, um, accomplished throughout her life. Um, her, we had the opportunity to get to know um, some of her family members um, even after her passing. And it, it's just, it, it, it's just important for us to, to continue to what she did and continue her legacy, make sure the girls and the boys in our building know who she is and that they can also recognize that they need to pour back into their communities and, 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 and just live in the way that um, she aspired for them to live. Yeah, yeah. That's got to be amazing for, for you, the staff, the children, the community. I still haven't seen the school yet. You know, I, I just haven't been on that side of town lately. I'm always on the south side, but um, we'll get over there because I grew up on the south side. So I tend to go on, go to Everett Street and stand in front of number 76 and reminisce about growing up on that block. Right. I'll stand outside that house for hours. It's, a, it's an incredible thing that I can stand out there and just stand there and on my old block. Right. But um, uh, Principal Hunt. I want to I want to I want to um, I want to read from your bio, from your bio real quick. It says during during her time teaching middle school math, Principal Hunt, it says, Ms. I put principal mm -hmm. principal Hunt began to think outside the box with her teaching and decided to bring real world experiences into the classroom, which increased student scores, meeting the New Jersey Department of Education proficiency rate by 15 percent consecutively. I want you to talk to us because I want you to keep in mind, we got leaders on here, man. We got young leaders on here. I have a young audience. You know, we got some folks who are not as young as others, but we have a lot of young people that, that tune in every week or watch the video. And, and, and they're looking for perspective. They're looking for guidance from the leadership um, perspective. So I want to ask you, talk to us about what you mean by this outside of the box thinking, but from the vantage point of how the leader can embrace that. Uh, good morning again. Thank you, Principal Cafele, and being on this panel today and being here with my former colleagues and friends, uh, Dr. Joseph and Dr. Davis, um, is, is definitely truly an honor and a privilege. Thinking outside of the box, I am a product of the East Orange School System. My mom, my family um, still lives there. So I'm there all the time. Um, East Orange is in my blood, is not going anywhere. <laughs> um, as a leader, thinking outside of the box, um, I stand on the principle of I will never do anything that I will never ask anyone to do anything I haven't done, I'm not willing to do, or I won't do with you. Um, as a leader, and thinking outside of the box and doing what I was able to accomplish at Cicely Tyson Middle School um, before they moved to the new facility, I was able to say, what makes a difference for me? What am I looking for? What keeps me going? And with that being said, it had to be as as the leader or as a leader it, they get my energy my energy and my drive is what takes 
my team to do what they need to do. So in doing so and putting myself out there and thinking outside of the box, I've always been that child that had to do something different because I don't roll with the crowd. I roll solo and I have to create my own story. So as a leader, you have to create your own story, but you can use bits and pieces from other people's story to build your story, but you have to use those pieces to make your foundation and build your house and build your school and build your community because everyone is leaning on you and looking at you. So I go back to what Ms. Joseph, um, Dr. Joseph said in her with her dissertation, we have to keep going. And it didn't matter. And even today, post pandemic, for me, it doesn't matter because everybody is standing on my shoulders and I have to stand strong on my foundation, which means that even when I'm tired, even when I just can't do it anymore, I have to keep going because I stand on that principle of saying, I will never ask you to do anything that I haven't done, I won't do, or I'm not willing to do with you. You're on mute. <laughs> My facts started ringing. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to do something that I, I, I say to myself, I'm going to stop doing, and I do it anyway, um, and that is uh, veering from 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 my my path here, and because you just said something, you said um, folks standing on your strong shoulders, right? There's um, I, I've been I've been reading from afar, just watching from afar, reading um, that whole idea of strong black women has become controversial, right? After all these years, and I understand it. It took me a minute. But I understand it. I understand. I understand the point that's being made. Right. I'm not going to lead us into that conversation. I want to stay with what you said, and I want to ask you this question. When you when you made the statement, it implied for me that you are a strong black woman. Make no mistake about it. So my question to you: What happens when your shoulders start feeling a little weak? because of all that stuff that's on them. I have to be honest. And again, it's not, it, you have to move from the professional to the personal. I have to pray. Mm. <laughs> I, I have to, I have to take a second and pray. And one of the, is, you know, I look at things as a gift and a curse and the curse with the pandemic where we were home and there was so many things that was happening that we had no control over. We couldn't confide in each other about it because we were all experiencing this anew. But it developed a positive within me as a human, as a Black woman, and as a leader to say, okay, what else do I need to do for me that is going to make me better once that building opens to continue the work that I've started, but to even do more work because more work is going to be required. And I don't know what that is going to look like. So for me, it's about affirming myself. It's about affirming my team. It's about affirming my kids and we're in the school community within which I work. And being able to, to know that even when I don't feel it and I'm not feeling good, because I've established that foundation with those around me within my building, I can get that from them. So when I come in in the morning, it, it may come from my custodian. It may come from the lunch ladies, that energy that I need to say to Miko, keep going. It they have given that same energy that I've given them, they give that back to me. So even if it's just a smile, when I feel like I just want to go in my office and shut the door and bawl my eyes out because mm -hmm. I have so much work to do, I know that, no, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, 
say good morning or even working off of the as a leader some people think that as leaders some leaders get so sheltered that they don't look to their team i look to my team because i know that my team of teachers and i refer to them as my team i'm just the captain everybody plays a part and i don't want to play all the parts i just want to help lead guide and facilitate the team and bring forth the mission and the vision of the school and the school district and, and get my children to where they need to be. So sometimes I look at my team members knowing some of their personal struggles and I get my energy from them. So when my shoulders are tired, I'll look at that teacher that I know is struggling with a health issue or that teacher that has kids and she had to get all her kids ready for school and get to work and they're on a parkway all morning and now they got to come in here and do i get my extra energy from them i love it i love it you know I, I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna continue to deviate y'all this is for the three of you uh i kept this up for a reason robin w i don't know robin w to my knowledge but it says i, I needed to hear this this morning I had a full week and I'm feeling low. But now let me put the part two on here. She said, I'm wondering if I want to continue mm. sharing. That's why this academy exists. Uh, Dr. Davis, starting with you, just give me a short version because because we got a lot to cover here. Can sure. You give, can you give Robin something? Sure, Robin. Um, yes, please continue. I would say first that you need to know, which I'm certain you do, who you are, right? Be clear on your values on uh, what you can take and what you cannot take. Establish clear boundaries. I believe in mentorship. As uh, Principal Hunt said, I cannot do this alone. I lean on my team. As leaders, we get work done through people, right? If we can't inspire people to carry out our vision and mission, nothing will get done. So lean on your team, create a network of colleagues, friends, personal friends, they will have your back. And sometimes you need to unplug. Sometimes you need to close that door, as Principal Hunt said, and cry. Sometimes you need to put your phone on mute, stay home, watch TV, and take a mental health day. It's okay. I do that sometimes, but continue the work. Um, there are too many children out here that need you, but also just remember to practice self-care and create boundaries and lean on your sister friends. Love it. Love it. Dr. Joseph. Yes. Uh, the thing I could really add is to not forget your why. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's what pushes us forward. Um, if you pray, pray, do exactly what, what Principal Hunt said and, and Dr. Davis in terms of really needing that self-care. If we... It, we cannot forget that that's part of our leadership um, characteristic. We have to focus on self-care because it's the only way that you can come back and be present for everyone else. Um, and once, you, once you've once you done that it's a, and, and be okay with it and not feel guilty about taking that time, I think that's part of why sometimes um, some of us may cringe when we hear a strong black woman statement because we, we, we're concerned that it's like, okay, I love that we're strong, but Who's help, when you when you give that person that adjective, it's almost as if you're saying now you can you don't need to help us, you don't need to pour into us, you don't need to do anything for us, and that's not true. <laughs> so please don't feel guilty about taking a moment, as Dr. Davis said, taking that mental health day, taking a, maybe a vaca a couple of vacation days, and then so that you can return because our kids that we need we need you. Yeah, I love it. I love. It. Did you want to add anything, um, Principal Hunt? Yeah, I mimic what my my colleagues, sisters have said and and focus on your why and definitely take care of you and and take time for you. One of the things that I believe in is the power of positive thinking and what you bring put out, you bring back to you. And I get up an extra half an hour every morning and I journal. And my journal is are my prayers, and I read, and and I and I read for clarity and listening because that helps me to get my day started. So you have to take care of you. Love it. I appreciate that, Robin. I hope you heard us, and um, stay tuned. And if you if you I don't know if you're new to the platform, but if you are, know that there are 200 other sessions that you want to check out too. In addition to this powerful session we're having right now. 
let me let me let me move. I got one more for you. We didn't even get to them talking points yet, but I got one more that I just felt that I felt compelled to ask the three of you. Same question for each of you. I'll just go in the same order. I've been going, Dr. Davis. If 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 a principal colleague, whether it be someone you know or someone you don't know, um, came to you and they said, I need to get more out of my assistant principal instructionally, right? I need to get more. Because right now, and, and 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 let me let me let me put a pin in, in that statement real quick. You all may have heard me say before, because I say it pretty loudly, that the assistant principalship, in my strongest estimation, is the most misunderstood and underutilized position in all of education. The counselor is probably a close second, right? But that assistant principalship, I won't paint with a broad brush and say every situation, every scenario. I'll say in many of them, particularly in urban and rural schools. Um, I see this assistant principal, this brilliant person being used as a full time disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. so, so with that, there's a principal out there now to go back to the question that comes up to you first, Dr. Davis, and says, I, I, I need to get more out of my assistant principalship instructionally. What advice might you have for me? So my response, my, my, my question to you, Doc, is what advice would you have for that principal? My advice would be. Um, how are you leading your assistant principal? How are you training them? Because the assistant, pr assistant principal is performing based on your expectation, right? So as a leader, you need to be clear on what you expect from people, right? And really give them the skill set and the tools how to carry that out. Uh, so one of my recommendations would be to have that AP shadow you. Like you should be in the classroom. 70% of your day should be in classrooms. You should be in the hallway. You should be modeling instruction if needed, doing your focus walks, giving feedback, have your AP lead staff meetings or POC meetings around data, right? Let's talk about data. Let's look at our tier three students. Because when you think about discipline, uh, there's a correlation between students that have academic challenges versus academic you know, assessment data. So look at that tier three data. What are some of those strategies that you can use in the classroom Right. So that's something that the AP should be focused on because there's high correlation that are students that have challenges uh, behaviorally that they have some academic challenges as well. Um, so I think it's twofold really being in those classrooms, pushing them to lead sessions. They can't just deal with discipline. You have to assign them tasks. And if they are having challenges with tasks, you have to help them along the way. That is the job of the principal. You are leading, you are getting work done through people, but you have to train them and teach them how you want things done and step back and become a facilitator. Love it. Love it. Let me go to you, Dr. Joseph. Same. And I think I, I would add developing a relationship with that assistant principal. That is extremely important. I've been blessed with a phenomenal AP um, to the point where even if they suggest moving her on, I'm going to be crushed. But um, I think you have to develop that relationship. See it as a partnership. Um, this way, as you um, move on and lead your school, you are automatically um, teaching and training that AP because he or she is moving along with you and understanding your philosophies. And don't be afraid to learn from that AP as well, because um, at times we, we think about this hierarchy, principal AP, on and on, but really we should be learning from each other and moving along together, getting advice from one another. And when, when, uh, when your partner realizes that you value his or her experiences as well, they also begin to blossom and 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 become very beneficial to your um, school building. So that's what I would add to Dr. Davis's comment. I, I love it. I love it, Principal Hunt. Um, I mimic the same as the ladies. Um, I would add on to it. Um, I've been pr privileged, in, particularly in Roselle, to um, have to select my uh, APs. And the one good thing is I'm a person that jumps off out of the box. So I always say to my APs, what is your why? And I need you to stand on your skill set and understand that I selected you because of your skill set. So I always you know, take them with me where we do things together. But I also am the, the surpriser and I say, I'm not doing this meeting, you're doing it. And 
we can talk about it on the back end of what the, the glows and grows of it. But I want you to be confident in what you're doing because at the end of the day, my goal is also to take that AP and make them a leader too, because they don't want to be a VP or an AP forever. So I, I want to continue to grow more leaders and learn from them as well as they learn from me, but be very confident about what they bring to the table that is important for our school. Love it, love it. To the audience out there, to the fam out there, I should say, um, lately, I guess since 2024, I've been asking my guests to send me some talking points on a particular topic that I would give to them of things that they're pretty much passionate about. And that makes for, I think, a richer conversation because it's not me asking a bunch of blind questions, but it's them speaking about things that they're passionate about within the theme of whatever it is that I'm addressing. So with that said, we're going to dive into those talking points and I'm going to go and I'm going to just stay with the sequence we have been in. And and um, Dr. Davis, you indicated that becoming a, a more resilient leader, staying alive through the danger of change there, 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 there there's so much there and what really caught my attention before i turn it over to you that second part staying alive through the danger of change um i want to, one of the things i failed to say to us offline you all feel free to jump in on each other's talking point and as, as i'll do the same um it's, it's not necessarily confined to the one that generated it so with that being said dr davis what, what are you saying to us with this one um the work that we do is extremely challenging. Uh, so going back to a Dr. Joseph's point, uh, you really need to understand your why. Your why is your foundation, right? And from your why, truly knowing who you are, what are your morals, what are your values, uh, what are your personal and professional ethics? And when you think about resilience and leadership, and especially Black women, we have to overcome so much. Right. And something else that I to you, Principal Caffelli, is we have to overcome the isms like sexism, racism, you know, ageism, gender biases. And it can be challenging. Um, you will be second guessed. Right. You will have people questioning the decisions that you make just because you made them, uh, whereas someone else can make that same decision and they're going to you know, follow the path. And your mindset must be clear. Uh, the only way to be a resilient leader as a Black woman, to me, is to be excellent, right? It's to, conti to continue to strive for excellence. Um, and what does that look like? Being a lifelong learner. So I constantly, I'm reading books. I'm in leadership programs, classes. I have mentors of all shapes and sizes because, yes, I need a Black woman mentor to relate to me. However, as a leader, you're leading all people and you need to understand the lived experiences of all. So yes, I have a leader that may be um, a mentor that may be a white male, a mentor that's a white woman, a mentor that may be of Asian descent. Because when we lead, we lead all and we need to be truly clear on who we are, but also we need to be culturally um, competent. We need to be uh, purpose-driven as a resilient leader. And think about the danger of change in public education Public education is constantly changing, right? The pendulum is shifting from one end to the other. Um, as school principals, we work with various different superintendents, right? So we may have a superintendent one year and another superintendent the next. We have to be flexible and adaptable, right? To answer their call, to you know, help promote their initiatives while promoting our initiative as a school principal. So how do we create a safe environment for our staff and try to shield them from all the outside noise and you know various things that may be going on so that we can create a safe learning environment for students and staff. So resilience, grit, it, it's there, especially as a black woman, but we just have to continue to understand what our why is and be driven with our purpose. You know, Dr. Davis, you I, I processed everything you said, but there, there was something you said, I don't know if you saw me reach, I reached for my, my pen to write something down you just said and I'm 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 I want to I'm I'm anxious to hear your thoughts. You said be excellent and then you corrected yourself and you said continue to strive for excellence. 
that caught my attention. And, and I'm going to tell you why before I throw it to you. Because I'm one of those, somewhere in my journey, I said, I have, I've got to take this word strive out of my vocabulary. Mm. Right. And, 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 and now I'm like, just be right. Mm. Be excellent. Um, you know, this, 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 you know, you, you, you all are familiar with this, this whole idea I have around closing the attitude gap. So I, I would call it the gap between those students who have the will to be excellent and those who do not. But it, but when I wrote the book, it said the gap between those students who have the the the, the will to strive for excellence. I took strive out. And, when, and whenever I get around to revising that book, strive won't be there. Talk to me why you made that switch in the middle of that statement. So I made that switch because I... I do, I, I do a lot of self-talk. So yeah. every day I'm saying to myself, I have to be excellent. I'm going to be excellent. But of course, speaking to people, right? I'm going to be vulnerable. It's like you want to be careful because you don't want to appear to be overly confident, right? And so it's always that strive. And so one of the things my mentors, Dr. Sean Joseph, uh, he tell his mentees, what's missing out there is excellence. You have to be excellent. You need to be excellent. And so that's why I said strive, uh, Principal Capelli. But in my mind, every day, I tell myself I'm excellent. I'm I, pushing excellence. I love it. I love it. I just wanted to ask you that. I know <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot, but uh, you know, we good. We, we good. Uh, anybody want to jump in on that? If not, then I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. Um, let me, let me. Let me get myself organized. One day I'm going to hire somebody to do all this stuff I do behind the scenes with this. But uh, Dr. Joseph, you, you say it can it can be a challenge to find balance between work responsibilities and family responsibilities. And of course, we talked about that in the context of the pandemic. But now that we're we're back in the building, brick and mortar, as they say, talk to us about that. Well, because of the what the pressures that we put on ourselves, right? We put the pressure to be excellent. I tend to use the word strive too much as well, <laughs> but we tend to be excellent at work and whatever that looks like to us, right? And then when we come home, we also have to do the same. It is difficult to be what you believe that leader should be and keep it in the confines of eight to four, right? Yeah. And yeah. when you go home, you also have a family life, you know, oh, so person, I have my son, I have my fancy, I have my parents, you know, they have reasonable um, demands and I have re responsibilities to them as well. Right. And in order to pour fully into them, that's beyond 430 <laughs> till 10 o'clock. That goes beyond those hours. So as a uh, leader, a, fem a woman leader, you can't just say, okay, let's time block this to this or this to this. It doesn't work that way. Those things bleed into one another. So it's a challenge. Is it a welcome challenge because you love what you do? And of course you love your family. Yes. But it's still, we have to recognize what that is and what we need to do in order to uh, be at a hundred percent when you're at work and then a hundred percent when you're at home. Yeah, that's um, and 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 you know, just in terms of this the stereotype of um a male principal versus a woman principal, you know, I'm my wife is literally a few feet away from me right now, and I'm I'm reminiscing of 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 my world as a principal. So I'm I'm in the school. I'm it's that's it. I'm there until it's late at night and I come home. Whereas she got all this other stuff she was doing as it particularly as related to my kids the meals, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And that balance is, I, I just believe in traditional roles, that balance is, is, is difficult mm -hmm. for a woman to be principal. And, a, and a, lot of, a lot of women I meet on the road who are APs, and I say to them, are you, are, do you feel you're ready for the principalship? And those will be the reasons that they say, no, I, I, I cannot right now. I got young children. I got this mm -hmm. that responsibility. So they can't do it. Tell, 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 tell me this, Doc, uh, Dr. Joseph, how can, is, is it possible to be that, that, that young mom with those young children and, and that, with that, that, that man, if that man is there, if he's not there, you know, either way, can I be highly, optimally effective with 
all those other personal things that I have to do? Yes, because I've done it. I've seen my colleagues do it. Um, if you have to sometimes bring your child to the workplace after because you have to attend an after school event, you do that. Um, if you have a husband and some of someone at home to assist, ask him <laughs> to help you and help carry some of that burden. Perhaps he has to learn to cook. <laughs> so <laughs> it is very possible. It's all about prioritizing and and being okay when it's not. Uh, the way that you pictured it. It's about leaning into your leadership team, um, making sure that you have a strong team around you that can also um, pick up that ball when you have to drop it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's natural because one of the things that I learned early from one of, of my mentors was that if you walk away from your building and it falls apart, you have to reflect on what type of leader you truly are. It should not fall apart. It should be a well-oiled machine. And and I I would add to that and say your home life as well. If you have to walk away and have to do something at work, your home life should also kind of be a well-oiled machine. Do they need you? Yes. Do they need you at work? Yes. But it it ha it has to keep going even if you have to step away and pour more into that other um, side of your responsibilities. I talked to a gentleman yesterday um we were you know i was doing a book signing and, and everybody that comes to the table you get to have a little short conversation while you while you're signing and he said to me um he was away from the school obviously because he was at the conference i think the conference is four days and he was concerned about the school in his absence and i said to him i said well let's let's distinguish leader from leadership mm -hmm. they're not the same you're the leader you're here with me but your leadership has to be felt while you're thousands of miles away and 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 i think that's what you were just speaking to when you talked about the fact that there's this synergy there's that team it's not just you you know we're not joe clark on the on the movie right we and that's not not that's not to disparage him or, or I shouldn't even say him, but more so the the character, because because there's there, there's some disconnect there. But 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 what I'm saying is in, in our leadership capacity, if we're if, if we're really building the right structure, then we can be gone. I always felt the true test of my leadership is when I'm not in the building, not when I'm there. Right. So uh, I love what you say. I love anybody else want to jump in on that. Oh, I would like to jump in. Uh Dr. Joseph, absolutely. I, I began my principalship with a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And so how did I do it? I don't know. Um, it was through God's grace, but I had a great support system, my parents um, who supported me. But my kids spent a lot of time at school with me, right? All they know is school. They would come. I would put them in classrooms when I needed to. And through that, it helped me to be more empathetic to the needs of mothers as a young mother. And so with that, my school became such a family. It became a family school when people needed to bring their kids within reason, right? I would allow them to because I found that you would get more out of people when you help accommodate their needs, right? Mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Davis, well, at that time, Ms. Davis, can I bring my child? They have a day off of school. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take off, bring them, put them in a the classroom, put them to work. So this day, my daughter is 16. When she's off, you're coming to school with me. I'm going to put you in the classroom and you're going to be a teacher assistant of the day. So use those kids to your advantage. Put them in those classrooms, have them work. I mean, it also created a hard work ethic in my daughter and my son because they saw me manage several competing priorities. And to this day, it has helped shape them along their path. And I see it manifest in their lives or taking on so many different initiatives while staying on the honor roll and et cetera. And as people say, you know, that apple didn't fall far from the tree. So I think you are modeling and setting a good expectation, an example of a professional mother. Good stuff. Good stuff. Let me let me go to let me go to our principal Hunt. She gave me this one word. She said equity. And that's, you know, there's there's a whole lot in that word. I'm, let me say let me say this before you go, uh, principal. Um, I say this probably every week, but I'm going to say it again. There's always <laughs> different, you know, different viewers on here that this word equity, man. People are afraid of it. It's the boogeyman. It's the four letter word. You know, people say to me, um, my, my clients, when we're having that that pre that that meeting before the 
before the presentation, um, it's, it's not uncommon for a client to say to me in certain states, um, Principal Kefele, we know you like to talk about equity, but could you not mention that word when you come to our our our, our conference or our in-service, whatever it is? Could you just not mention that word? Now, you know, I, I'll explain to them what what this word means from my vantage point, because in most cases when that happens, they're asking me not to use a word that they know nothing about. So they're, they're they, you know, they're just going on what, what what whatever the political flavor is at that time. And I said, but let me explain what I'm saying to you, you know, and, and, and what I did before I go right to you, Principal Hunt, I just reduced it to, as we say in math, it's lowest common denominator. I said equity for me is meeting young people where they are as they are. Now, when we talk about racial equity and gender equity and this equity and that equity, that's part of the conversation. But. I want to go first to the core. Mm. And if they give me the latitude to have the extended conversation, which I want to have, but first let me make sure that they understand that equity is not a political word, right? It's 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 just children are coming in as they are. Let me meet you right there. That's got to be the goal to meet you right there, but as you are. So I may want you to be something different but you're who you are. So my role is to meet you as you are, right? Mm -hmm. So then they say, oh, I say, yeah, equity is just good teaching. In fact, great teaching. That's all it is, is great teaching. And when it's absent, then there's, there's a serious void in what we do in that classroom and in that school. With that said, I hope I didn't take your thunder. For mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what are you telling us when you say equity? When I say equity, um, I also think of meeting people where they are and doing the work to get them to where you need them to be or where they want to be. Um, one of the things from just listening to my colleagues, when you think about balance and you think about the Black woman in education and the Black woman that is the leader in education, when I connect that to my position as a principal in equity and I sit amongst at the table with people of all different races and colors, equity is different. Yeah. It's very different because I look at the things that I had to do to get to this seat and the things that some of my other colleagues not taking away from them, they didn't have to do that. Mm. So it's funny that you say when people are afraid of the equity word, because if we're going to get down to it as a former math teacher, what's the lowest common denominator here? And what does that look like? Because society says this is what you need to do. But as a black woman and as a leader and in this space, mm, that wasn't my common denominator. That was your common denominator. So therefore, when you're trying to find that balance and you're trying to look at what that means to make sure that not only am I dealing with my students, my staff, I always call in my district, they always hear me refer to my, as a math teacher, S cube. And cube means S times S times S. So for me, it's my students, my staff in my school. If we're not talking about those three S's, then mm -hmm. we're not having a conversation right now because mm -hmm. those are my priorities. And that's what I have to do. And I have to attend to as a leader, which means that I do have to find balance in my life because I am coming from the single black female leadership uh, platform because I've I don't have children and I'm not married. So it's very easy for me to go back to your statement from earlier when you asked everyone to take time during their day to, to take 15 minutes. Where are you? During the day, I'm in the mix. But once my babies go home, I find myself sitting in my office till seven, eight o'clock at night because now I got to do the work, the other part of my work. And then when I look at that and I attach that to equity with regards to some of those others that didn't have to work as hard as me, is it really equitable? It's not. 
So I always ask the question of what does equity look like to other people, especially in our leadership space? Because when you talk about the urban and suburban districts, it's different. It's very different, especially when you are a, a district in need of improvement or a school in need of improvement, or you're trying to battle against all of those things that are constantly coming at you. It's like, mm, your equity don't look like my equity. So let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You know, you, you talk about the opportunities. I, I remember when these stages, these con these these conferences, these education conferences, them big stages, mm -hmm. I remember when they weren't accessible to me, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm looking at all the other people up there speaking. I'm like, why can't I get up there? But I had a mentality that I'm coming. You 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 those doors may be nailed shut, um, but I'm 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 going to be on them stages, and I just had to learn how to navigate these 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 waters. So that ultimately I can be on those large stages, mm -hmm. right? So, um, because the because the equity just wasn't there, let alone the equality, right? It just wasn't there. So I had to figure out, well, how 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 do I maneuver this? And um, I think I've, I've I've done a good job of doing it, but you know, but but see, here here's the thing: we have to make sure, and this is and this starts with our leadership, mm -hmm. that we are training our teachers to have the right conversations. So that the children are being exposed to not just reading, writing, and arithmetic, but but they're learning how to navigate all these challenges, all these obstacles. And as 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 uh, as Dr. Davis would say in her her next one, I'll put it right on the screen: overcoming these isms, right? Because if 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 all I'm if 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 I'm only proficient in 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 content, but now I don't know how to get out here in the world. And, and and find my space because the the isms are are are, are too overwhelming because you think about the and i'm gonna stop rambling in a second but you think about the um the volume of people out here who have certain skill sets certain talents certain gifts and are not living them because they don't know how to maneuver to get from point a to point b so that's 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 a large volume of people in our society Right. And it's, it's, it's so necessary. So with that, let me just go right. To, I think that's a good it, it, it dovetails right into uh, Dr. Davis um, comment, overcoming gender stereotypes and the isms, sexism, classism, racism and ageism. Yes. To us. So, so Principal Cafele, I um, I thrive on obstacles. Um, I love it when I have uh, people that will doubt me because that's what actually motivates me for every major success that I've had among my professional and personal uh, leadership journey. It's truly been because I've had like detractors. And for me, once that's in my mind, like I am clear on my mission, right? But to think about overcoming uh, the isms, it's really about being the hardest worker in the room. Like you have to outwork everyone else. You have to read, you have to invest in yourself, right? And when I say invest in yourself, uh, you know, we like to spend money and shop and, you know, have our self-care, but we actually have to spend some of our own money to get that professional development that your school district may not pay for, yeah. right? Spend some of your own money to attract or getting those spaces so that you can meet those mentors of high quality or people that can help take you to the next level. So it's really about uh, being excellent, investing in yourself, being the hardest worker in the room. You have to outwork everyone to overcome the isms. You really do. There's no way around it. You have to outwork everyone. And always in my mind, I have to be the hardest worker in the room. So I will outwork you. I, mean, I put a lot of time in uh, what I do. I put a lot of time in my own personal professional development. And that is what has sustained me. Let's let's stay there, Doc. And anybody feel free to jump in on this one too. Let, let's let's stay there for a second. We're we're we we live in this and, and we're gonna live in this for, forever, this this social media age mm -hmm. where anybody, let's say someone who's successful, now they can get on here and they can talk about their success. But then you got another element on here who may not be experiencing success, but mm -hmm. they give the impression that they are, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, it could be that they just want to put it out there and now it gives them something to strive for, whatever the motivation is. 
but the young people that you three are in charge of every day, they see this. And it gives the impression that I didn't have to really work hard to get this. I'm just, I'm here now. I've arrived, right? Like, 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 again, I, you know, I always make reference to what I do as a speaker and, and the volume of people who come to me, I want to do what you do, but you don't know my grind. You don't, you don't know my 20 years of speaking in PTA meetings for nothing and no parents showed up, but I kept doing it because I'm trying to build something. So I'm leading a school all day and then I'm in Newark somewhere to PTO or Bloomfield or New York City or Philadelphia, not knowing if anybody's going to show up, but, but doing that from 1986 until 2004 before I had my first breakthrough. So people don't know the grind. They just see, they see this, the, I don't even want to call it finished product. They see what they see now because we ain't never finished, right? So they, they, they see what they see in real time. So talk to us now. This is at you, Dr. Davis, but I want the two of you to feel comfortable in jumping in here too. I'm not worried about my script right now. Um, how, what, how do we convince young people and maybe via the teacher or maybe it's you yourselves because you all know i used to talk to my kids all the time right so how do we make children understand that those things that are worth attaining are going to take some grind some grit some hustle some sacrifice some commitment some mission some vision some sense of purpose how do we make them understand that it ain't happening like this Right, because they see the nice um, finished, what well, they think is finished, shiny product. Mm -hmm. They see you and they say, oh, it's nice. I think we have to tell our stories. That's the only way people will understand the lived experiences. I, I believe in hearing the lived experiences of other people. We have to tell our stories. We have to be vulnerable. We have to not be afraid to tell them about the failures that we've had, about the rejection, right? That time I did apply for that job, but I did not get it. That time I did take this test, but I did not pass the first. You have to tell them about the people that helped you along your way and not be ashamed. That's the only way they will get it. Because to your point, social media, everyone's pretty. They have the shiny car. They have the position and the titles, but not understanding that for me, a form of self-care is actually watching TV. Like I don't get the opportunity to watch TV. I'm always working. I'm always in meetings. I'm always reading. I'm doing something. So to sit on the couch, watch a Netflix series, that's a form of self-care. That's the grind, right? So really, truly telling stories um, and sharing and being vulnerable. People need to see you vulnerable. They need to see and hear about the failures that you've had. They need to um, hear about the long hours you work, right? You get home, you cook dinner make sure your kids are settled, but then you're jumping on meetings. Then you're working, right? You're working on your research. You're writing a dissertation. You're in class. They need to hear all of that. They need to hear that you don't have time to, um, you know, run an errand. <laughs> they need to hear that you don't have time. You know, for women, you know, we have to maintain our appearance, right? So a man, no disrespect, Principal Cafele, they can shave their head, get a haircut. <laughs> for women leaders, it's different, right? Because we still have to maintain our professional appearance. And that's, you know, having a hair salon appointment, having a nail appointment, because those things do matter, right? It's the whole finished product. And how you, we don't even have time sometimes to do that. Mm -hmm. So try to figure out juggling all these balls. So really telling your story and showing vulnerability. They need to see us vulnerable because we're not perfect. Right, right. And I'll even go back even to that. Um, Dr. Davis mentioned earlier, because you know, we're all products of East Orange. The best role model that I have to this day that I always think back on is Irene Nichols, principal of Clifford J. Scott High School. I don't know how she did it, but she always shared her stories with us. And no matter what time of the morning or the day or the weekend, she was always there, always there with us every step of the way. And, and that is like, if like, that is my biggest, like strongest mentor in education that I could ever think of because she 
was like that person that was always vulnerable and that was always there and always telling us this is what you got to do and this is like she kept it very real and very transparent and if you didn't like it too bad you was going to sit and listen and sometimes i have to i have to have those uncomfortable conversations with my students and my staff to say no Ain't nobody got time for that. We're not doing that. This is what we're doing. And I'm going to tell you why we're doing it. Because you, like you said, instantaneous, they want it. Instantaneously, they want to see it happen. And no, you're, you're not going to become an honor roll student overnight. You got to pick up a book. You got to read. You got to write. Get off that computer. Get off that cell phone. You you have to be able to, to prioritize and compartmentalize. So I, I definitely, definitely agree. And definitely when I think about that, I do go back to the greats of East Orange education and think about those Irene Nichols and Laura Tremings and even some of those phenomenal teachers like Miss Miss Youngblood, Miss Irby. Those were like heavy hitters in East Orange. Miss, <laughs> they 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 didn't take no mess. Miss Jenkins at Patrick Healy, like they they were hardcore. You know, like they made stuff happen. Miss Page, who was my principal when I was at Healy, they made it happen, and they were very real and honest and vulnerable, and they they told us what it is and what it's gonna be, and we saw it. They didn't just talk about it. We saw it. That's good stuff. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Joseph, you want to jump in real quick while it's on my mind? You, you guys are mentioning all these old, the old timers. Uh, Henry Hamilton will be, we, he and I are going to go one on one on April 6th. Oh so I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Go ahead, doc, <laughs> anything, Dr. Joseph, on that? I just wanted to highlight and underscore um, everything that my colleagues just said. I wanted to add that with my students, they're tired of hearing my lectures and I'm not going to let up because the, I know that we are, um, our challenge is dealing with a force that is extremely great. Social media is in their faces and it's constant. It's this constant struggle, but we have to offset it with our stories and what is necessary. Remind them, begin with the end in mind. Where do you want to end? Just because you see this person flashy on social media right now, there mm -hmm. is a story behind that individual. And if they somehow just blew up in that moment, that's one person. <laughs> what do you need to do to get the end that you desire? And so constantly telling them my story, my staff, they've seen me cry. They've seen me get angry. They've seen me happy. I don't hide that. I don't wear that facade because I think it's important that they understand um, that it's all, it's all, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's joyful. It's, it's all of those things, but they have to see that process as well. So they can also show their students what the real is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Let me move on. Um, Dr. Joseph, I have to ask you a question on this one because I because I wasn't sure. It says, I strongly believe that it is my responsibility to serve as a role model to mm -hmm. students. And you wrote inspiring leaders. And I didn't know if you meant aspiring or if was inspiring was correct. I what you wrote is correct. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I meant to say that off camera and I, I forgot. All right. So, so let me share that with the crap with the fam again i strongly believe that it is my responsibility to serve as a role model to students and aspiring leaders what are you saying to us i believe that as they say too much is given <laughs> much is required right i think that as i've moved along in my career in east orange as you stated i've been there since 98 i've had phenomenal mentors, um, some of whom um, Principal Hunt mentioned. I wanted to add Dr. Watson, Dr. Gloria Watson. Till this day, I can call her friend. Um, she She's still my mentor, but I call her friend now. Um, Miss Lorena Simmons, just the women that I was able to emulate and see, you know, okay, I can do this. Because when I started in East Orange, my desire was stay in the classroom, do what I need to do with my 20, at the time 30, students, 
and and this is you know this is filling me this is good but seeing beyond that and the understanding that i can be i can lead others and and to be great in that classroom i can do certain things those are that's because of those women and i say that it is our job it's our additional responsibility to serve as those role models just in the way that we are sometimes it doesn't take sitting down that eighth grade student and telling her your story sometimes it's living it and letting her see what you do and how you do it and i also believe that's the case for other women that come into the district I realize that I'm getting older as I've, you know, as the decades roll along, we'll say years roll along, there are new women coming in um, into leadership roles. Take the time and sit with them and, and hold their hand. Tell them, you know, um, all that talk about a glass ceiling in our certain district, that's not there for us. What is it that you want to do? How do you need me to help? So, and that's how I see it. Everything that I do, I consider myself, someone's watching. And I think it's important to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. You're 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 showing them what can be done, no matter where you started. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, in, in in looking at the statement again, serve as a role model to students. Let me let me let me stop it right there, and and I, and I want to focus on the girls, right? So they so they've got this 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 successful woman, um, principal, and therefore this role model all day long in that school talk to us about and i guess this is this is this is this is going into you a little bit talk to us about your 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 consciousness of the fact that you are this black woman in this school with 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 all these girls that are watching you is is that something that's on your mind or yeah. have you been doing it so long that it's 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 taken for granted now that you know i'm in here with them Talk to me about that. I, I see it as a responsibility. It's a, it's a must in our job. I, I they're actually my students are actually blessed with two um, um, administrators, female black administrators that they can emulate and they can decide who can who do they relate to best and and can talk. And then beyond just the administrators, we, I have. Um, my social workers, all the women in the building. And I think it starts from the moment I leave the home. As this Dr. Davis said, it's the way that you dress, the way that you carry yourself. That, that Those are small things. And then when you talk to them about, well, you have to wear uniform, and then you get that pushback because, you know, children, and then reminding them, well, well, honey, it depends on where you're going. When you come to school, this is your job. How should you dress for your job? How should you dress for church? How should you dress to go to the store? These are the things that we're teaching them, sometimes not explicitly, sometimes it's just in how we're doing it, but sometimes you have to be clear and you have to say it. And sometimes it's reinforcing something that they are learning at home and sometimes not. So so that is how I see. It's just as serving as the role model in anything that they do. If I'm walking by and I hear something, it's not against school rules, but I stop. And I may join that that their conversation and say, "Oh, really? Is that what you did? Why? You know?" And then continue that conversation so they get my perspective from a person that had of this big age, you know. Um, so I think it's just in everything that we do. And yes, it takes us out of our offices. It has us moving around and actually actively listening to what the girls are saying and the boys, because they have challenges that we don't, we didn't have at their age, um, and 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 we have to respect that as well. I love it. I love it. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? No, you, she hit it on the head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the three of you, um, walking, living, breathing role models, you know, and, and, and I'm saying that to say I want to bring the fam out there into this portion of the conversation to say, to say I'm talking to you as well. Never lose sight, folks, that once you walk into that building, Mm -hmm. All eyes on, as Pac said, all eyes on me, mm -hmm. all eyes on you. They 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 watching you, mm -hmm. right? Even if you feel that they're not, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. are. It's it's. I mean, the volume of of inboxes and and, and messages that I receive from 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 people in their thirties and forties who used to be my students mm -hmm. to tell me things, uh, just tell me uh, just a plethora of different things about me. And, and 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 whatever impression I made on them when they were a youngster, right? Says and and I'm and I'm, and, and sometimes it's the youngster is the, the person is writing me. I'm like, I didn't even know you were paying attention to me. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's like they know my life story. Sometimes they tell me I've been following you on social media all these years. 
I just never, you just don't see me liking stuff, but I'm looking at everything you post. So we don't know who's watching mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't know how they're receiving us in the journey. So therefore we got to make sure that we're always conscious. So folks out there, remember that you, you leader, you leader number one or leader number two, whatever it is, but them young people, they, they, they're watching your every move, right? Let me keep moving. We, um, down to number six. I don't know. We're going to finish today. Y'all we'll see. <laughs> conversations are rich nevertheless were you telling us principal hunt with this opportunity so one of the things that i learned and when you when you posed the question to me inviting me on the platform you said give you words and that was hard because i'm i want i was like oh sentences he said words so I, the opera, word opportunity came because I, again, um, like Dr. Davis said, I, it was, it's been a struggle to get to this moment, this day, this time. And delay is not denial. I knew that I had to keep going. And I knew that in order to keep going, any opportunity in education for me to learn, take it in, digest it, chew on it, marinate on it, and then put it back out was what I needed to do to get to where I am today, which you have to be willing to take those opportunities to grow and learn on you, even if it is uncomfortable as hell. You got to be able to do that to say, okay, if that is what you want to do, and if that is your why, and if that why is in the forefront of your mind every day, all day, then you have to sit back and get beyond yourself to take those opportunities to grow. And one of the people who um, made me realize that was one of the, another great educator from East Orange, who just so happens to be my aunt, Thelma Murray, used to say, girl, you better sit down and get beyond yourself and understand if this is what you want to do, or do you want to do something else? And if this is what you want to do, then you have to get beyond yourself and up and take every opportunity that is presented to you or find opportunities to grow and learn and understand and put yourself in places where people will see you because now they see that you are taking advantage of opportunities. And sometimes people won't offer those to you because they want to see how much do you really want this? How much do you really want it? And if you really want it, then you're going to find it and you're going to navigate a way to get to it so that you can have it. And that is what, that's what came to my mind when I, when you posed the question to me, I said, no, opportunity. I, I knew that throughout this 26 years, I had to take opportunities to grow me to learn about me, to navigate me in order to make sure that I have a space that I can do the work that I need to do because somebody is always watching and you never know. So that is how I can say that sometimes my nose and sometimes my uncomfortableness was actually awesome for me. I, I have to say that to um, Ms. Tremens, who pushed me out to say, you gonna teach math? And I said, no, my degree is in music education. I don't teach math. And then I embraced it. And then in be just being in Roselle, being the junior high school principal, and then my superintendent saying, oh, next year, by the way, you're gonna take the five, six building. And I said, who's doing that? But look at that uncomfortableness mm -hmm. presented an opportunity that now I'm the National Inspire Award leader for Curriculum Associates. Mm -hmm. Nobody, I didn't know that was going to happen. And that, that was because I had to get beyond me, mm -hmm. take the opportunity to do it because I surprised myself. 
And all of those people are standing on my shoulders. So they're looking at me to see well, what she going to do. So I had, and I'm, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a Jay-Z fan. I will not lose. So I got to keep going. <laughs> I love it. You know, uh, Miss Trimmon's name keeps coming up. She was the only language arts teacher I had in middle school. She was my language arts teacher for grades six, seven, and eight at the old Rutledge Avenue school where Henry Hamilton was my principal. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. That's, we were the last class before the Hart Complex opened up. So we were 1974. That was the last class. And then the Hart Complex opened up in September of 74. Wow. 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 Yeah, so that's going back a little way. That's, that's good EO history, right there. That's good EO history, right there. Henry Hamilton was a young cat with a with a with a black afro and a and a black beard. <laughs> Miss Trimmins was extremely brilliant. Um, smart, yeah. smart as a whip. So I know you got some good instruction in her class. Great instruction, and then she's the one. She was the first one that took a chance on me when I came mm -hmm. to East Orange. I was her building base sub in the '88, '89 school year, oh, wow. where okay. Wayne, where Wayne Stackhouse was an eighth grader. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, Wayne Stackhouse was an eighth grader. Mm -hmm. so I had him every day because I was in the class where the teacher was out for a uh, long term. So um, and then when Stackhouse was ready to teach his first year after college, I offered him his first job. Oh, okay. he worked for me. Yeah. So, you know, the truth. Yeah. So a little little EO history there. For those, of all, those of you that don't know who we're talking about, we're talking about the vice president of the East Orange Board of Education, mm -hmm. who was on here about two or three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, let, let me keep moving so we can get as much in. I think that this one, um, Dr. Davis, you pretty much yes. talked about it in the other one. So, I, you know, I, I thrive on obstacles. I'm told that if I can't, if if, if that it can't be done, uh, I'll push harder. Right. Yeah. Uh, so let me let me let me go to the next one you had, though. Um, where we at here? Here we are. Here we are. So the, so, the, so the next one you had was what do, what do you know today? What you know today can affect what you do tomorrow. But what you know today cannot affect what you did yesterday, Condoleezza Rice. What are you saying? What is she, well, she's saying it, but you're using it. So what are you saying? Uh, you can't go back. You just have to push forward and try not to spend too much time thinking about mistakes that you have made. Because I often think about my first year teaching and what a disaster that I think that it was. At that time, I thought it was great. But knowing what I know now, it was like an ouch moment, right? But so I, bet you, I bet you them students that you had feel that you were a superstar, right? Right now in real time. Correct. Correct. You're right. Correct. Because uh, I could, you know, tend to be hard on myself. And speaking to this quote, um, just that the importance of continuing to grow, really self-reflect, take a step back, reflect, um, just continuing to push forward that our kids need us, our staff need us, and that we have to evolve, right? Uh, as you stated at the beginning of the program, that yes, we know a lot, but there's a lot that we don't know, right? And so one of my sayings to myself and my staff is, you don't know what you don't know. So this is why you have to constantly push harder, continue to learn, continue to grow, get yourself in networks and circles, and um, really about decision-making. So what I know today, I can reflect on some of the decisions that I've made in the past, and I know that there are some changes that I have to make. And so it's important just to continue to grow and to evolve. Yeah, it's vital, vital. Anybody want to step in? All right. I think we're going to get it all in, and we're we, we in a good place. Let me go to Dr. Uh, Joseph here, and you indicated the perils of perfectionism self-imposed pressure to do everything perfectly. That's heavy duty. What are you telling us? What I'm saying is I think that we have an, uh, an idea that we have to do things perfectly, even though, to Dr. Davis's point when she reflected back in her first year, we think it has to be perfect. And and sometimes it doesn't. And it has to, we have to be okay. We have to learn. We Let's learn from our errors. And sometimes it wasn't that it was an error per se, but we still have to make it better each time. And just needing to be perfect in all aspects of our lives, I think that's an added pressure. 
that mm. we put on ourselves, especially as women. Um, I, I, I may even go so far as to say, especially as a black woman, because of what you said earlier on, where they say, you know, we we have an S on our chest, a cape. We wear this cape. Um, and I think that it we need to know that it's OK to make mm. mistakes. We need to know. Um, that it's okay if we do something one way, as long as we know we came from a good place and our intentions were pure and our intention, our objective was to ensure that our students or staff members are are in a, in a meet a certain standard, meet a certain step. And if it, if that was an issue, the next time we we are faced with that same issue, we do it differently. Same with home life, because I'm always having to collect, connect that to home life. If whatever you were trying to do, whatever attempt you were trying to make, if it, if it falls, if it fails, stand back up, <laughs> because you learn from that. The only time it's a failure is if you didn't learn. Yeah. And that's how I, you know, and I know, and that's, that's something I, that statement was more of a reflection of who I am. I think I have to be perfect. I consider myself a perfectionist and um, any little mistake sometimes will derail me. And what I've learned to do is kind of pause, mm. reflect and just go back. Sometimes I, I, I drive my mentors, my friends, my colleagues crazy with, well, did I do that right? What happened? You know, but, but you need that sometimes you need to be able to um, have important people around you that will tell you the truth and and how you can um, just be better and do better. So so for clarity, what, what would you what do you consider yourself right now? Then are, are you are, do you still see yourself as a perfectionist? I am, and, it is, and I but I consider it a character flaw. <laughs> I see myself as a perfect. I'm working my way past that because I think that um, I think you can be excellent but not feel that it, you have to be perfect because perfect in whose eyes, who's defining that perfectionism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when I call myself a perfectionist, it's, it's how I see it. Um, um, uh, oh, should I have worn that? Should I have done that? Should I have said that? And it's constant. And that and that's just not being kind to yourself and to your own mental health. You know, so it's a, for me, that's different from excellence. Yeah. yeah. So that's something I have to work on. You know, I, I, I used I think I used to be a perfectionist and somewhere along the way I outgrew it. Mm -hmm. I, I continue to be very meticulous and give great detail or get great attention to detail. I, I, I continue to do that, but I'm not concerned about being perfect anymore. I'm not concerned about doing a presentation and stuttering on something or stumbling. I, that, that, that doesn't phase me one iota. Right. It's when I'm doing videos for clients and I make mistakes, I, I tell them up front, I'm not going to edit this. You, you're going to get one take and however it comes out, I'm going to go with it. And I know that people are going to see it and I'm and I'm good with it because that, that that stuff just doesn't matter to me anymore. But I remember a time when it did. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's that's like in the rearview mirror. Now it's long gone. But right. whatever, whatever, whatever you get, right. that's what you're going to get. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and as they say, those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. There you so go. You have to do what you need to do. There you go. There you go. Anybody else want to jump in? Y'all good? You said, we've been on a long time. No, I'm good. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Yeah, we, and we still got to do them BAM impact questions. Uh, um, Dr. Joseph, one of yours I skipped because you, you, you covered it when you were talking about the glass ceiling. Right. So, I, you know, so we good on yours. Let me let me go to this. Um, this next one, Principal, um, Principal Hunt, you were you were talking about. I didn't know if you were saying advocate or advocate. Or both. 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 Right. Talk to us. Um, being an advocate for yourself, being for me, when I think about advocating, I think about advocating for my students and for my staff and for my school, my district. Um, because when you're coming from an urban setting, the, the people don't see you, you know, when you go to these conferences and we go to these meetings and we have to put on these badges with our district, sometimes we get the, mm, where are you from? Oh, oh, like, where is that about? And for me, it's like, no. I'm here. This is where I'm representing. This is my district. These are my kids. This is my staff. So let me be an advocate and, and advocate for them. And then make sure that when, when I go back home to work, I 
express to them that you have to advocate for yourself. You have to speak up for yourself. You have to make sure that you are being seen, but being seen in the correct way. And you are being heard and you're being heard in the correct manner in which you are respected and that you are saying something that has worth and value mm -hmm. to what you're doing and how you're doing it. And it goes back to, again, being that African-American woman and walking in that room and, and into that space where people don't see you. But now I am to... I'm at that point where, oh, you're going to see me and you're going to see my kids and you're going to see my staff and you're going to see my school. And we are not perfect, but what we do do, we do it well. And every day we try to be better. And it's important for us to be better and do better. And as uh, Dr. Joseph says, sometimes you have to look back and say, okay, how could I have done that better? But the good thing with that is being able to have another, to live another day and do it again and say, okay, now this opportunity has come up again and I'm going to do it differently and I'm going to do it better and be better. So I want to, I make sure that I am just not just advocating. I am an advocate to make sure that when you see me, you see my school. So when I come out, like Dr. Davis said, hails, nails done, hair done, everything did. I have to, you need to see me. You need to see me because I am representing these, all of these people and they are important to me. So I need to make sure that wherever I'm at, I put my best foot forward. Love it. You know, we are, we, we just about at the end and we go to those BAM impact questions. They're like one word or one sentence and we're done. But before we do, I would be remiss, uh, Principal Hunt, if I didn't ask you, uh, give us the significance of the award you won recently, the Inspire Award for 2024. Mm -hmm. um, I, to be honest, I did not know at working with iReady and Curriculum Associates for over 11 years in various districts. I had no idea about what they um, call the extraordinary, extraordinary educators. Then that branches out to the ultimate award of Inspire Award Leader um, Leadership Award. I knew I did not know that that existed. Mm -hmm. um, and being being able to be uncomfortable and and moving forward. Um, I was put in a very uncomfortable position by my superintendent um, last uh, school year to be moved to the middle school. Um, it was a situation where he laid it out of what the issues were and what he needed me to do. And my first day meeting with the staff of which I had never had the opportunity to meet with them before, I asked them to jump with me. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how we're going to get it through, but I'm going to do it with you. And I did in September of last year during my parent teacher meeting, curriculum associates people showed up. I didn't know why they were there. Um, they came with some swag. So I just thought I was giving out swag to the parents. And they presented me with this award. And before they presented the award, they had been watching the growth of the school that I had been newly assigned to move from, neg from a negative percentage points in math and ELA for their iReady diagnostic to 187% growth percentile nationally. And that was big <laughs> and I still it still didn't click what that meant until they broke everything down for me and I had had the largest percentage growth for three diagnostic assessments in one calendar school year um, where most of my students went from three grade levels below to what they consider a stretch growth of one grade level below one to two grade levels below their current grade level, increasing student achievement, which did match our NJSLA scores. So um, I had the, 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 out of all the leaderships, 
that utilized the product of iReady and Curriculum Associates, I had the highest consecutive growth in one calendar school year, which the team went to bat for me, unbeknownst to me. And the CEO of the company named me the National Inspire Award leader. So I will actually be speaking in Philadelphia next week for oh. Curriculum Associates. Oh, so okay. it's been awesome. It's it's been awesome. It's 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 been awesome. <laughs> um, I'm just getting started. Um, and with that, you know, came other opportunities. So I'm excited. And that's why when you asked me to say these to select words, I'm like, okay, this is perfect. Um, mm -hmm. so I know that I have to take this opportunity um that has been given to me and advocate for not just my kids in my school, in my district, and in my staff. I need to advocate for all of our students, especially mm -hmm. my girls, because as we mentioned earlier on, we these babies are facing some tremendous challenges that we did not have to, we didn't deal with social media, didn't exist. Yeah. So to know that I have to, to come from a different lens to, to make a difference. It's, it's a lot, but I'm committed to doing it and I'm going to get it done. Love it. Love it. Congratulations to you. Keep Thank up you. the great work. Congrats. Hit it Thank out the park when you give that presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For that audience. Let's go through the rapid fire, bam, impact questions real quick. Um, it's, it's, it's one sentence or one word responses. So it's, if you find yourself inserting a comma, I'll probably interrupt and say, eh, right? <laughs> <laughs> so give me so this rapid fire. I'm going to give you both, uh, you, the three of you seven. And then the last question I'm going to give to all of you, right? So we'll start with Dr. Davis. Is education on the right path for underserved children? Yes, but we still have a lot of work to do. I'm optimistic. Can true equity occur in America's schools for black, brown, and other underserved students? Yes, it's occurring in my school. Does Dr. Crystal Davis' work contribute to the progress we desperately need? Oh, absolutely, yes. If you could do a reset on your life, would your line of work be different or the same? It would be the same. Why do you continue to do this work? I'm a champion for children. I love children and I want the best for all children. What fires you up, particularly within the work that you do? My why, which are my two children and wanting the best for them as I do for all. And what do you absolutely love about your work? I love people. I'm a people person and I love pouring into others. Love it. Dr. Joseph, what do you dislike about the work you do? The red tape. The, the, the typical response we get over these 200 weeks is, is the politics, mm -hmm. right? So there you go. What has been your greatest victory in this work to date? It's daily seeing my students flourish. What was your greatest mistake in this work? Not understanding what I was truly getting into. Hmm. What has been your greatest challenge in this work? The politics. Mm -hmm. Are you proud of your first year as an assistant principal? Yes, but no, I learned from it. Are you proud of your first year as a principal? Same answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and lastly, who inspires you in your work? The other incredible women in the district every day. Yeah. Principal Hunt, what are you reading right now? Could It doesn't have to be a book. It could be an article, a blog, a, a tweet. It could be anything. Acts of Faith by Inyala Van Zandt. 
what book would you recommend for our viewers this afternoon? The Bible. Mm -hmm. What do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished yet? Oh, <laughs> sky's the limit. I can go with that. Um, are you are you satisfied with where you are professionally now? Yes, I am. No, I'm not, because I feel like I still have so much more work to do. What could you say to a viewer out there who's who, who watching right now um, who continues to face closed doors? Delay is not denial. Keep going. What could you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? Find, go back to your why. And lastly, if Principal Tamika, Tamiko, I'm sorry, Principal Tamiko Hunt was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? Fiery, go get them, unstoppable. <laughs> Dr. Davis, if, if Dr. Crystal Davis was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? Resilience, never give up, love. And finally, Dr. Evie Joseph. If Dr. Evie Joseph was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? Perseverance, mm -hmm. fairness, love. And to the fam out there that's viewing right now, whether it be live or watching the video later, if your name was a word in the dictionary what would be your definition hey folks man this was phenomenal it was great the fam here they they know that when we get to the end they applaud you with emoji so they've already started so those who um who who are not part of the fam yet let us know if, if today's presentation if today's conversation resonated with you if you found it to be worth your while, if you found it to be good information, if you found that you could use what you heard, if you found that you could take this back to your school, infuse it into your leadership, give us your favorite emojis as I see you started. Give us those emojis and keep them coming. Let us know. Let our let our guests know that that um that this was time well spent today. And let me get my emoji, which is my Louisville slugger. And <laughs> this is. <laughs> this is what I use to just say to you all that you you every time you came to the plate to bat, you hit it out the park, grand slam, four runs in every time. So that's a whole lot of runs. I can't do the math in real time. One day I'm a I'm a I'm gonna do the math though. So out of these 200 some odd sessions, I'll say how many runs that is. Maybe one of you already figured that out. But um, but yeah, this was this was phenomenal. Uh, I'm sure that there are people on here that would like to stay connected to you, follow you on social media, or, or or may even have a question for you. Tell them how they can reach you via social media or however you would want someone to meet you, because there's a lot of people that saw this and a lot who will see this later. I'll start with you, Dr. Davis. Sure. On LinkedIn, Facebook, um, I am Crystal Davis, and also on X, Crystal Davis. On Instagram, I'm Principal CD. All right, let me let me let me make sure they see the spelling of your name there. Let me let me get that out the way. No, mm -hmm. uh, that way. There we go. Yeah, very good, Dr. Joseph. On Facebook, I my full name, Evie Joseph, one word. Um, Instagram, YVYJ12. Um, email YVYJ at AOL.com. And Principal Hunt. On uh Facebook and LinkedIn, I am Tamiko Hunt. And on Instagram, I'm Miss Tamiko. Very good. So, folks, if you want to reach out, then you know how to reach them. I'm sure they'll be accessible to you. Just don't send them the dissertation, right? When folks send me something that's just a little short, something, something, I answer the same day I receive it. But when they send the dissertation, I, I get to it when I can, because usually the dissertation is multi step multi-step questions multi-tier questions and those are hard because i receive you know every, any given day i could get over a hundred of them you know so it's you know it's, it's it's tough it's tough but i try my best 
Hey, y'all, I, I, I appreciate you for um for being here again. And uh, we won't make this the last time. I appreciate you just spending some time with your big brother this afternoon now uh, and uh, talking some leadership for the fam out there. Let me uh, do my rundown. Y'all stay put, and then we, we holler off, 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 off camera for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, folks out there in, in the land, appreciate you being here. One of the things I forgot to do during my, my intro, I don't know how I did it, but I'm going to do this real quick. I know it's a lot of different people on now, but I forgot to tell y'all, man, if you don't have the assistant principal 50, go to Amazon right now and get yourself a copy, man. This is uh, this is invaluable. But while you're there, make sure that you get the aspiring principal 50. Get that. Get your hands on that one. And then while you're there, get my newest joint, the assistant principal identity, protecting your leadership mindset, fervor and authenticity. And then while you're there, don't forget to get the is my school a better school because I lead it. And then while you're there, you might as well cop the principal 50 right and then one more the equity and social justice education 50. man i might as well show you all these last three man get yourself closing the attitude gap y'all see i like to write get yourself the teacher 50 and get yourself motivating black males to achieve in school and in life you can just go right to amazon put my name in the um the search on amazon and all these books will show up and then my out of print books will show up too but they're just that out of print so uh you won't have them i gotta revise those those are all self-published so with anyway every saturday morning sean hurt 10 o'clock facebook live followed by create and educate with uh dr Sheikha houston and dr tammy taylor man we were together all day yesterday in new york man good time with my sisters in this work and then unlock the middle with uh josh tovar on sunday nights at seven o'clock that's all eastern time all these times and that's all facebook live Make sure that you uh, register. If you're going to join me in Houston for the School Leadership Institute with Principal Kefele, register on principalkefele.com on the homepage. Just scroll down and you'll see it. And that's July 9 and 10 in Houston. Two full days. We go 9 to 4, I think. And then we even wrap during lunch. We wrap during, in, 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 in between two days. You know, so it's, it's, it's a whole lot of talk, a whole lot of leadership conversation. So join me. This will be my seventh annual. This is the first time we're going to be in Houston. We usually do it in Charlotte and um, Orlando. So we, we move into Houston this time. Uh, subscribe to the AP and New Principals Academy YouTube channel, man. We are 20,300 subscribers. So I want to get that up to 25,000, man, because I feel that this, this platform is beneficial for folks all over the world. So subscribe to the channel. Binge watch the 201 sessions or the 200 that you may have missed. And also, those of you that want to become a speaker, I got the nine hours of video on that channel. It's five videos, parts one through five call so you want to be a professional speaker let's talk so check those out and i'm gonna be i took this week off i protected the week i'm not doing any speaking this week this is the first time since january 1st i ain't going nowhere i'm sitting right in this house except for when i go to the gym and uh but i'm going to re-record the sessions i did on so you want to be a best-selling author because i did those when i had i was going through a midlife crisis i was buying new eyeglass frames every week so when I did the videos, I had a different pair of glasses on for each video. And when I look at it now, I'm thinking to myself, man, you look crazy. Right. So I took them down after about four years and I'm going to re-record them this week while I'm home. So those are coming. You want to be a best selling author? You want you you you, you want to have all these books with your name on them? Let me show you how to do it and not only write the book, but the book is a bestseller then uh, I'll have those. I'll, I'll be posting all four. It's four of them. I'll be posting them this week. Uh, make sure you like and follow the Facebook page, uh, AP and New Principals Academy Facebook page. I haven't written a commentary in a few weeks because, y'all, I've been tired on Sundays, man. Either tired on Sundays or, or I'm flying soon and I just don't have the energy, but I, I think I'm good for tomorrow, so I'll have a commentary up tomorrow. And then lastly, um, your diet. Make sure you're taking care of yourselves, y'all. Make sure that you're eating right. Make sure that you are exercising and make sure that you're taking whatever precautions you need to take as it relates to these diseases and viruses that are out here. Right. You can't lead if you if you're not here. Right. So make sure you're taking care of yourself. Other than that, I appreciate all of you. Have a great week. Have. Oh, I forgot. Next week. Hold up, y'all. Don't leave me yet. Next week. How would I skip this? I got an international session next week, man. Y'all don't want to miss this. I got I got Jacqueline Harriet from Nova Scotia, Canada. 
I got Jennifer Doyle from Trinidad and Tobago. And I got Saint, I got uh, Christina Timber Glover from a little island, little Dutch island I spoke on several years ago called Saint Eustatius. Right. I mean, this, 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 you got to take a little crop duster plane to get there. You fly to St. Martin and then you take this little prop plane, propeller plane to get there. And uh, it's, it's small, but they got great people, man. And I, I think I've been there three times. They got great people there. So we're going to have the three of them and we're going to talk leadership, but we're going to hear it from an international perspective. So you don't want to miss this. This is going to be fire. So with that being said, have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Peace. Thumbs up. Now you cock that fist back. Count the three. One, two, three. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> I see y'all next week and make sure that you have a great week, man. And stay safe out here, man. These streets is a little getting a little funky, man. Talking to all of y'all. Stay safe out here.